That was too nice, Skip. Um, I'll let, uh, we're going to talk with Roger about his own background and career in more depth uh, sitting up here, but let me sketch it briefly here at the start. He was born and raised on his family's ranch in Del Rio, Texas. And if you don't know where that is, you're not alone. It's 150 miles due west of San Antonio on the border with Mexico. He went to college in Tennessee at Sewanee, one of the centers of literary tradition in the South, associated with figures like Alan Tate and Andrew Lytle, and more recently, John Meacham and John Jeremiah Sullivan. He subsequently moved to New York and spent 14 years at Harper's Magazine, the last four from 2006 to 2010 as editor. And during his tenure at the top post, the magazine was a finalist for the National Magazine Award seven times, winning for fiction in 2007 and reporting uh, for reporting in 2010 for the Guantanamo suicides, which uncovered evidence that uh, three alleged suicides at Guantanamo may have been homicides. And importantly for these times, he also spent considerable effort revamping, rethinking, and reconceiving the magazine's website, a subject we'll get into further. Um, as a writer, he was a National Magazine Award finalist in the Essays and Criticism category for his piece on Cormac McCarthy's No Country for Old Men, in which he contends that the dismissal of the novel by other critics is quote, symptomatic of the shallowness and haste that characterizes so much of our literary culture, uh, unquote. His uh, 2010 book, The Mendacity of Hope, Barack Obama and the Betrayal of American Liberalism, uh, pretty much uses the cudgel of James Madison to bludgeon the president from the left. So uh, the book he's working on now is very different, uh, an exploration of the borderlands separating Texas and Mexico that draws upon his own family's history and the contemporary political realities of trade and immigration. So uh, please join me in welcoming to Little Rock, Roger D. Hodge. Thank you. And this works too, okay. Um, let's start with the, your, your background. Um, can you talk a bit about growing up on a ranch in Texas and uh, your education at Suwannee and how these formed your notion of the South? Sure, I, I, as, as Jay mentioned, my family's in the ranching business in, uh, in Texas and we have been since basically since the 1850s. And my family moved into that part of the state in the 1880s. And we've been there ever since. And growing up, I spent all my summers and all my weekends at the ranch working, uh, working sheep and goats and cattle. And in the summer, I would be horseback every day, all day long, uh, gathering sheep and drenching them for stomach worms or doing whatever, you know, sort of emergency measures we had uh, to take care of during the summer and shearing sheep and hunting varmints at night and uh, sometimes when I got a little older driving to Mexico uh, late at night with my friends and uh, so growing up in the country like that I didn't really think too much about the South or Texas or anything like that. I was just a kid working on a ranch and uh, driving my pickup and drinking beer on weekends and things like that. Uh, but when I went to Suwannee, uh, which some people think was odd to, for someone from Texas to end up at Suwannee, but there, it's like a quarter of the student bodies from Texas. Uh, and a lot of people from my hometown went there. When I got to Suwannee, I, I began to realize what the South was and how uh, Southern, really, Texas is. I, I, several times this week, people have said, oh, is, is Texas the South? Do you think Texas is the South? And I respond, well, yeah, is there any question about it? Uh, 
but there, there does seem to be a question about it, and it might be because Texans themselves often don't think of themselves as Southerners or don't brag about being Southerners or, or think too much about it because they're too busy bragging about being Texans. <laughs> but if you've, if you've ever spent any time in Texas, you know that it's a Southern state, uh, culturally, politically, historically. There's just no doubt about it. Uh, but I didn't really realize it. I thought, I thought the South was this kind of exotic region when I was a child, even though my grandmother was, my great-grandmother was in Alabama in Thomasville. My mother was born in Alabama. And we would drive uh, along Highway 90 east uh, through uh, Kudzu. And, and I just thought, Kudzu, my god, that was the, the scariest thing I'd ever seen in my life. <laughs> I would have nightmares about it when I was sleeping in my grandmother's, my great-grandmother's house, because the Kudzu came right up to the back porch. Uh, so we, we would make those trips, and, and even then, so it was an exotic place for me. But when, when I got to Swanee and began to, to road trip all over the South with my friends and read, really read in, in the Southern literary tradition, because that place is steeped in that tradition, uh, I began to realize the, the, the kind of ineffable something that holds these regions together. Uh, even though, if, and all of you know this, uh, that all, the, it's not one thing. The South is not one thing. It's 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 uh, a million things. It's a it's a it's so many. It's such a diverse and rich region. So I think that goes some some distance toward answering your question. Right, and the and literary writers, but Twain, McCarthy. And, and our own Charles Portis have sort of uh, traveled that border between the West and the South. And, definitely, and, definitely. And, and McCarthy makes that migration that, some, that my ancestors did. Uh, my my great-great-great-grandfather was born in Tennessee. And there, they moved, they came on the riverboat to Missouri, got off at Bluffton, and ended up in uh, in uh, Clay County, Platt County. Uh, they were among the founders of Weston, Missouri, and then founded Weston, Texas in the late 1840s and 1850s. My, one of my relatives was the first postmaster of Weston. And, uh, and so, so that, that migration out of Tennessee and Kentucky westward and then down into Texas uh, is a road that so many families travel. And, and so M McCarthy, growing up in Knoxville, made that migration into Texas uh, in the mid-80s. And I made the reverse migration from Texas to Tennessee, not even knowing at the time that my ancestors uh, were, f were from Tennessee. Then you made the next migration to New York. <laughs> I did. And, and my, if you, go, if you take, follow my family back far enough, in the mid-1600s, they arrived in New Jersey. Some of them did, anyway. And, uh, and slowly moved westward uh, with, with the rest of the country. So I, I definitely have gone all the way back. Well, I never lived in England, but <laughs> went back pretty far. And, and so, it, and like, like you make the point about in escape velocity, you, it's a lot of people leave the South, but most of us return in one way or another. So, so coming back to the Oxford Ameri coming to the Oxford American is is very much a homecoming for me, I think. And that that uh, history of Southerners leaving and coming back is uh, makes me think of Isabel Wilkerson's book too, where she documents the Great right, Migration that happened among African Americans and, and how many of them are coming back to the South. So it, it tends to speak of the, or, or uh, represent the South as a more dynamic place than we think with people moving in and Absolutely. out. Absolutely, definitely. That's definitely the, that's definitely the case. Um, you, you moved to New York originally to pursue, pursue graduate studies in philosophy, is that, is that right? That was my, that was my cover story. <laughs> <laughs> What, what attracted you to magazines 
um, and in particular to Harper's. When I was at Swanee, Jack Hitt, who's a great writer, I, I'm sure a lot of you have, have seen his work. And a great South Carolinian. Yes, too. indeed. Who has a very funny piece on the New Yorker website right now. I, just, I won't tell you what it is, but it's a shouts and murmurs that just went up today. I encourage you all to read it. Uh, Jack came, he was an editor at Harper's, uh, one of the original group that was with Lewis Lapham when he redesigned the magazine in the mid 80s. And he came, and I'd, I'd never even heard of Harper's Magazine. Uh, uh, when, he, when he arrived, I think I was a sophomore. And I didn't really read magazines at the time. I was, I was deep in Faulkner country. And so Jack showed up, and he was so funny, and he was talking about how much fun they have putting out a magazine. And, and I, I just looked at him, and I thought, I, I want to be him. <laughs> That's what I want to do. And he encouraged me to come to New York and, and do an internship at the, at the magazine. But I couldn't figure out how to afford it. I, living in New York City, which I'd only been there once, um, and working for nothing, and I just I couldn't imagine how to do it. So uh, eventually, so I went, did, got out of school, went to North Carolina, and started trying to write uh, professionally uh, for less than a hundred dollars a piece, basically. Uh, and then through lived in Jacksonville, Florida, but eventually figured out a way to go to New York. But my ambition was really to get into into publishing, to get into the magazine business, and. I wanted to work at Harper's Magazine. And after doing my master's and getting all the way through to my dissertation, uh, I had to make a decision. Am I, gonna, am, I gonna, am I gonna go all the way and do my dissertation and be unemployed? Or am I going to do what I wanna do and take the chance? And so I took the chance and I was turned down for the internship, I didn't get it. So, Okay, what do I do now? I'm gonna, maybe I have to leave. I don't know. But so then somebody quit, and they called me up. I was sitting on my. I was I was literally sitting on my couch reading the one ads, and I, the phone rang, and they asked me to come in because somebody had just walked out after the first week of the internship. So I went in and uh, got hired as a fact checker and uh, and. Uh, eventually clawed my way to the top of the, of the master. <laughs> did, did you have other mentors at the magazine besides Jack? Uh, well, Jack was gone right. by the time I... Uh, so really, Lewis Slapham was my, was my mentor. I, I, I learned so much from him and from the whole staff. It was a great staff. And that staff, the group of people that were there when I got there, have now taken over the magazine industry. Uh, that we've... That our group, it, it was really a school under Lewis. And now Clara Jeffrey, who was there, is now the editor of Mother Jones. Jim Nelson is the editor of GQ. Joel Lovell is at New York Times Magazine. And, and, uh, and, and so many people from that generation of editors have, have gone on to do great things. And that, really, that's a testament to Lewis and, and his, and his uh, care as an editor and, and his care uh, in developing the staff and really, really letting the young editors there go forth and, and do good work. And that's something that, that I have completely internalized. I, f I think that's so important is to develop staff, develop the young people who are, who are coming and doing internships and, 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 and working hard. And that's the kind of thing I want to bring to the OA uh, because there's just so much talent out there, and you just got to give people a shot and give them a chance to, to do great work, and and they will they will rise to it. What are what are you most proud of having accomplished at Harper's while you were there? Oh, gosh, that's that's a tough. Or a story or anything that you were particularly I I, proud I, of? I can't really single out a particular story. I'm I'm proud of of the awards we won certainly, um, but mostly I'm proud of 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 my writers and, and, and my editors who I worked with who, and the group that, that worked with me have gone on to do great things. Uh, Bill Wasik is now at, at, at Wired and, 
and Luke Mitchell is, is basically running Popular Science. He's, well, I shouldn't say that. He's the deputy editor of Popular Science. I'm going to get myself in trouble if I don't watch out. <laughs> <laughs> and I have, I have some, some of my colleagues are now at the London Review of Books, and Jake Silverstein is the editor of Texas Monthly. He was one of our interns when I was there. And, and we, had, we had a, and it continued after Lewis left. We had a school, really, a school of journalism. And, um, and I think that's still true. And, but, but there's no reason that we, can't, that we can't recreate that kind of dynamic and creative environment here. There's just no reason we can't do it. Uh, what was it about the OA uh, under Mark Smirnoff's editorship that you admired? And uh, what uh, issues have you identified uh, or things that you would do differently under your editorship where you think the magazine needs some help or improvement? Well, when I, when I discovered the OA in, sometime in the early to mid-90s, I'm not exactly sure when, I was so struck by, by how fresh it was and, 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 and surprising. You never knew what was going to happen in the magazine. Uh, what, you know, I just, from issue to issue, it was it, it was seemingly reinvented, and, and there, that, that energy was attractive, and just the, the writing and the vision of it, the, the idea of, of, it seems so obvious that the South deserves a great magazine, a magazine that, that, that covers this part of the country uh, with, uh, that approaches it with, a, with a, an attitude of respect and curiosity rather than uh, amusement and contempt which is what, what, what we usually get from, from the New York-centered media. And so it was, just a wonderful, it was just a wonderful invention, a wonderful vision. And it was, it was exciting, and it was tr there, was some, there was something vital and true about it. So uh, I've always read the magazine with tremendous admiration and affection. And when it would go, I, when it would, I've said this a couple of times, but when it would go broke or, or go out of business, we, we, I and, all, and my friends and colleagues, we would all be so sad. And then, and then somehow by some miracle it would rise again. And uh, so that, that, that perseverance was something also that I have always admired. And as for, for what I would, change or do differently. Every editor does things differently. It's, uh, there's a great piece by Harold Hayes in the current issue that speaks to this so eloquently and, and what a great editor he was and what, what, what titans he wrestled with, <laughs> with Norman Mailer and, and others, Terry Southern and, and, and these great figures from the 60s and 70s. Uh, uh, the original title of that piece is the editor's uh, implied control, I think. And the editor, has, the editor makes decisions in a million different ways all the time, and it makes a different magazine. But the, there's definitely a limit to what the editor can control. Uh, the writer is the most, <laughs> the most important limit to the editor's sensibility, because no matter what you want to do as an editor, you have to have a writer who can who, who is the vehicle of that vision, or a set of writers, a collect, uh, you, your contributors are really the most important element in, the most important ingredient in the recipe of making a magazine. And so the writer can make, makes, I mean the, the editor makes a decision, okay I'm giving you this assignment, I'm giving you that assignment, you not you, yes no, yes no, all the time, but it's the writers above all, who make the magazine. And that's, that's, that's the, probably the most valuable lesson I learned from Lewis Lapham, is the, the importance and the, the sanctity, really the, the power of the first person singular. And so I could talk in abstract terms about what I would do differently in this or that situation, what stories in, the, in various issues of the OA I thought were less successful or more successful, but uh, I, don't, I don't know that that really accomplishes anything useful. What I can say is that I uh, will enter into a conversation with the traditions of this magazine and with, with the same kind of respect that I expect 
our writers to uh, approach their material and to take it seriously and uh, to, to be respectful, not just of, of the, the magazine staff who, who, who are all important also, uh, but to the readers who, who have certain expectations and, and, uh, and desires and, and want, to see, want to make sure that the magazine they love doesn't get turned upside down and, and, and sideways. That's, that's not what I'm interested in doing. I, I want to continue the tradition of the OA, uh, and, and I think in any magazine there's always room for improvement. Uh, because make, putting a magazine out is, a, is a, just a series of, of compromises with deadlines, and you compromise with the writer, you compromise with the, uh, with the illustrator. You can't, the, the editor's not a dictator. Uh, the editor is a coach. Um, what are your um, plans for the web? I, I think I've read an interview where you were quoted as saying that obviously the web is the future of, of magazines. And how do you propose to produce both a beautiful um, you know, paper product and also something that you know, is, is uh, uh, lively and exciting on the web? Well, it's, I, I would have to say I would amend what I said about the web being the future of magazines slightly, because the web is not, the web in, in and of itself is just one protocol. It's, it's, it's a protocol that was invented and, these, and it's going to change. And it's just, it's not always going to be the same. And we've already seen the rise of, of applications uh, now with, in, on, on tablets and so forth. But certainly, electronic publishing is the future of publishing on some level. And I hope to God that we always have the paper product, because that's what I prefer. But at the same time, I love computers. I love electronic. I love gadgets. And uh, I tried to learn, I tried to teach myself how to program in Perl just because I was so interested in the power of programming. You can do amazing things with just a script. Um, and so, I think that that resistance is futile, <laughs> as they say. <laughs> what you have to do is figure out a way to work with it and 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 use the power of the internet. And it's really the internet. It's really the the internet more than the web, because the web may may be superseded by some other some other uh, platform, some other protocol. Because really, it's just it's it's a matter of 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 what kind of devices we're going to have in the future. We may end up with electronic ink on paper-like uh, uh, devices that recreate the look and feel of, of normal, old-fashioned paper uh, magazines and books. And that would be welcome, because there's nothing that's more environmentally d devastating than making paper. That, that is one of the driving forces in, um, in a lot of wetlands degrega degradation and just, just the, some of the worst pollution in the south, particularly in the south, is produced by paper plants. And uh, the, so this is something that there are all kinds of reasons besides the, the, um, the uh, ambitions of the computer industry to, to move us away from, from paper. And so this is, this is something that's probably inevitable for all kinds of reasons. So you have to exploit this stuff. You, you can't just let the internet push you around. Uh, I've, I've quoted uh, this early web publication was suck.com uh, back in the day. There was suck, there was feed, there was word, there was all these single word, all these single term publications in the mid 90s. And 1995, it's the earliest post that survives at suck.com, which is the, in, the net giveth and the net taketh away. And you have to be sure you're on the, on the receiving end of, of all the good, good stuff coming off the internet and not just giving everything away. Because that was, the, that was the original sin of the newspaper industry, was to just, OK, we'll figure out the business model later. Here, come and take it. That was a big, big mistake. How do you feel uh, about theme issues? I mean, the music issue for the OA has been, you know, wildly popular, and uh, I was one. But but they ventured into other mm -hmm. areas of theme. I think theme issues can be great. I love the music issue. I think 
one of the problems with the theme issue is that, is that writers just write to the theme. And so you usually don't get a writer's best work when you say, here, well, we want you to write about X. And so you get a bunch of people writing about X, and some of it's going to be great, and some of it's not. Um, I, like, I like a theme to bubble up from the material. When you see writers who you have a bunch of assignments out, and you have pieces coming in, and you, it's like you start to notice a pattern. Oh, these writers, they're all, they're, they're, they're all zeroing in on something here. Or we have writers who, who, are, who are thinking about something that, you know, what, is there a frame we can put on this? And then, then you start brainstorming, and then suddenly you start, you know, then you start making different assignments, and you start finding fiction that fits in with this, and maybe a poem, and then boom, you've got a theme issue. And if you can do it far enough out, then, then there are all kinds of things you can do on the publishing side to, to, really, to really make that, th that theme pop. Uh, but if you have a, too many annuals in the works, in the calendar, then I think it becomes burdensome. So I think it, it's, it's important to be careful and not lock yourself in, especially when you only have four issues. Would, would you like to see the OA expand to more issues in the future? Not, well, not necessarily, not, not particularly, actually. Uh, I like I like the quarterly um, schedule, and uh, if you make a strong enough issue, it's going to take people a while to get through it. And uh, a monthly can be great, but a monthly the the economic pressures on monthlies are probably going to drive them out. I mean, there, I think we're going to see more and more monthlies going to bi-monthly, uh, and I think weeklies are even in a, in a worse squeeze, probably, than the, than, than the monthlies. But the monthlies are really being squeezed. So there are, there are economic pressures that might be insurmountable with, with moving the, some, a, a, a magazine like the OA into the monthly space. Um, in, in your opinion, what's the state of literary journalism uh, today? I think there's just an amazing amount of good work being done. Uh, everybody, all, everybody I know in magazines wants to publish long-form literary journalism. And so you see somebody like John Sullivan, my good friend, uh, you know, he was at Harper's. I, I helped bring him to Harper's. I hired him as a stringer when he was still at the OA. And um, he, 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 but he got too big for us real fast. <laughs> and with that uh, horseman passed by essay after his father died, which turned into blood horses, he, he was just on his way. And so his next platform was GQ, and he wrote some of the best, uh, some of the best uh, literary journalism that's ever been written. It's just, it's for the ages. And, and, and if you haven't read Pulphead, the collection of his magazine essays, I, I encourage you to do so. Uh, there's just amazing work there. So you have somebody like John who's, who's, who's still just growing and getting stronger as a writer. Um, and other OA contributors, uh, almost too numerous to mention, I don't, I, it's always dangerous to start picking names out of the air because then you, you're, you're, well, what about, why didn't you mention me? Uh, <laughs> so I'm mentioning John because he's one of my dearest friends. And, uh, and it was John, more than anyone, who made me pay attention. I had read the OA, certainly, before I knew John. But, uh, but I read, I, 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 when he was here was when, was when, um, when I became like, a committed reader, I think. So anyway, that, to answer your question, I think we're in a, in a in kind of a renaissance of literary journal, you know, they talked about the new journalism. We hear a lot of talk about the new journalism, and, and that, that term got old in 1971. <laughs> but so now what do we have? Well, if it was the new journalism in 19, what, what basically what we have is journalism. Uh, good journalism is, the way, is my preferred term. And uh, there's just so much of it out there. It's, and, and I think that it, so, so much of the most ambitious writing today is in this um, mold. 
that we've gone through in, in, in American literature, we've gone through periods of, of where, where the most ambitious writers were all writing novels. And I think that it comes in waves. And certainly there's a lot of ambitious fiction out there right now. But I think so much of the energy among young writers is in nonfiction. And um, so I want to I harness that energy and, and put it to work for the OA. And we've, it's not as if we haven't been doing that in the past, but I think we can do more. Um, but I, I also have to immediately say that fiction is, is very important to me, and we won a, a fiction um, ASME uh, in 97, as you mentioned, and um, I think we're, gonna, we're going to be much more ambitious and aggressive in bringing in the best fiction that's being written in um, American letters today into the OA, as long as it fits within our basic scope. Uh, I'll ask one uh, broad, sweeping question, and then we'll open it up to questions from the audience, because I know people probably have a lot to say. But um, some uh, commentators might argue that because of our culture now, the uh, Twitter culture and and global communication, that a uh, magazine about a region is um, necessarily, um, or what is the value of a magazine that f chooses to focus on a region in this kind of age where everybody's communicating with everybody else no matter where they are? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that local journalism is really the future of journalism. Because the big national publications are having, as I've said already, having a really hard time. It is increasingly hard for national monthlies uh, and, and national literary magazines to distinguish themselves in, to, in, in such a way that they can, they can keep the readers and keep, keep the advertisers. But, but a regional publication, like the OA or like This Land Press in Tulsa, uh, is, is speaking to a place, and, 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 or Texas Monthly is another great example, uh, speaking to a place and telling the stories that matter in that, in that place or in that region. And when, when, you, when you can do that, when you can focus in on, on something discreet like that, you have, I, I think, a, a very strong advantage where, where you can bring people out of you can uh, you can rely on writers who live in these communities who ha who have grown up or have grown up in these communities or you're not just parachuting in to do the um, the scene piece about uh, Katrina or something now um, the 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 challenge with in in the age of Twitter and Facebook and all of that where everybody's um, Chattering all the time about everything else, and and, and not you know, it, are are there, is there going to be an audience for, for, the kinds of stories we do? I, I think, absolutely, there will be an audience, definitely, because you can't just survive on, on, sweets. You have to have a meal. You can't just survive on Twitter, um, and I think that the. The fascination, the fad of Twitter uh, will probably pass. Already Facebook is passe among the teenagers. My, my son, uh, my 15-year-old, is, is already, he's already over Facebook. He's like, give me a break. Um, that's such a waste of time, he says. Uh, <laughs> and you, you, hear, you hear teenagers talking about how, they, how Facebook, keeping up on Facebook is like a job. And, <laughs> and they, <laughs> and I just think it, 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 the, the social media is a fad. Uh, so in some form, it's going to continue, just like everything else that comes along continues on, on some level. But the, the enthusiasm that people have um, will eventually abate. It's just, you can't watch TV all the time. You can't be on Facebook all the time. Eventually, you're going to have to nourish your soul. And I'm sorry, but 120 characters is not enough. Well, good. I, someday I hope to be reading the OA on my Google glasses, 
So. <laughs> It'll probably cause a brain tumor. <laughs> um, all right, I'm happy to open up the floor for questions. Yes. Let me get a mic to you. Spoken of the roles of spoken of the roles of authors and of editors. Uh, what about owners? Uh, what uh, kind of impact and significance did the ownership of Harper's and who does own it these days have on the way in which the news that Harper's emerged as such a strong periodical? Well, Harper's, like uh, the Oxford American, is owned by a nonprofit foundation. Uh, so no one owns Harper's. Harper's is owned by the American people just as uh, the OA is, is ultimately the, the, it belongs to uh, American literature. I mean, there's an ownership structure in a nonprofit, and all you have directors, but these, but but the the directors in a nonprofit are basically stewards uh, of this of of this entity. They're not the owners. So uh, I, I think that uh, the nonprofit status of a magazine is incredibly valuable because it 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 removes the magazine from the immediate uh, whims, if you might call it, of, of the marketplace and, 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 and shelters it somewhat. But it's not a guarantee, obviously. And there are plenty of nonprofits that fail. Uh, but ownership is, is clearly an important part of, of the stability of any publication, whatever that ownership structure is. And for good or ill, often for ill. I don't know if that answers your question. I mean, if you're if you're trying to get me to comment on Rick MacArthur, I'm not going to. <laughs> Rick saved Harper's. I'll say that. He did. He saved it. Otherwise, it would have gone away. He raised a lot of money, he did, and he put a lot of his own money into it, and he continues to. You spoke about uh, literary journalism, nonfiction, fiction, what about poetry? Good question. I am an avid reader of poetry, and we will publish a lot of poetry. Uh, definitely. When I, when I took over the reading section at Harper's, I made a point of having at least one poem in every section. And I think I kept that up the entire time I ran that section. And we uh, ran a lot of poetry in the magazine. And, and we're, we're going to run we're gonna. We're gonna. I, 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 I spoke about fiction and nonfiction. I, I should say uh, that that we will run. It, we will run a lot of poetry. We will, and we'll continue to run personal essays and memoirs and literary criticism and art criticism and architecture criticism. The whole gamut of of cultural writing will, will continue to be in uh, in the magazine, and we won't be neglecting any genre. I should maybe mention at this point, uh, Dave Anderson won a National Magazine Award for his videos on the... Yes. Uh, and what role will the visual culture, video culture play in the future? Well, that's been very important. I'm so glad you brought that up. The, uh, the So Lost series and the other videos that have uh, been produced for the website have just been amazing. And that's that's a very exciting new opportunity that, that, that we have as a magazine is to, to get into that side of things because that's something we could never do. You could never do that, anything like that with a magazine. Uh, I should also say that all kinds, there are all kinds of, of off-the-book uh, opportunities uh, with, with Warwick, who you all know, and you, know, you all know what a, a dynamo of a publisher he is and how, and how ambitious he is, and, and with this uh, amazing board 
who's, who is so supportive of the magazine, and with all of you, everyone in this community who's so interesting, uh, interested in the magazine and supportive, the, the opportunities are, are endless. I mean, South on Main is, I couldn't believe it when I saw that space. <laughs> it's amazing. And, and the events that the magazine has been doing all over the South um, and, and elsewhere, that's, that, that kind of creative approach to reaching the audience is, is a necessity in today's literary marketplace because there are too many storytelling machines out there competing for the readers. And just putting a magazine on a newsstand is not enough. You have to have events. You have to put on a show. It, you have to get off the book page, off the magazine page, and and reach the reader one way or another. Uh, do you have an elevator pitch yet for what the OA will be? Is it the New Yorker meets Ufala or <laughs> Garden and Gun learns how to have an adult conversation or <laughs> something like that? Uh, I'm not very good at elevator speeches, <laughs> as you can probably tell. I tend to start talking and I go off on some tangent, and eventually I work my way back around to the answer. Um, so the, the short answer there is no, I don't have a short <laughs> You, you mentioned somewhere, I believe, that you're planning on commuting. Yes, it's, it's, a, it's sort of a tough commute. So, so does that mean that you'll be working on the magazine from New York? I, I have um, a very strong-willed family. And it's not my decision to make uh, uh, as to whether my, my wife is going to be willing to move to Arkansas. I think that once I get her down here and, and, um, and you all go to work on her, maybe uh, uh, we can get something done. Uh, my son, my 15-year-old son, is in art school in Manhattan. He's an artist, and he basically won the lottery when he got into this high school. Uh, so that's a tough one. Uh, he's playing varsity soccer, and it's just, it's, it's hard to, to pull up stakes. And, and pick up and move. But um, I personally would like nothing more than to get my family down here and, and, and just live here full time, because it's not going to be fun flying back and forth all the time. But that's what I'll be doing. Uh, and I'll be spending as much time as I can here. Um, but fortunately, the, one of the ways that the net giveth is it makes it easy for uh, people to work together on a project, even though they're sitting hundreds or thousands of miles apart. One of the, uh, one of the things I worked on during uh, the time that I've been a, a full-time writer, it's not technically true. You can't be a, it's almost impossible to be a full-time writer. You have to do side projects. And one of the things I would do is be editorial projects. And I, I worked on several uh, uh, one-off magazines uh, that had distributed staffs, and we were none of us were in a, in the same place ever. There was a there was a designer, there were three editors, and there were all these writers, and and we we had a dinner once we went to press, and some of us saw each other. Um, so it can be done, and it can be done very 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 successfully and very efficiently. But it is obviously better to be in the same room because it makes brainstorming faster and and and, and more efficient, and you. Just the happenstance of like the conversation in the hall can 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 really be a, a creative uh, kind of conversation to have. So uh, definitely, I want to I want to be here, um, and I think eventually I will be. But it's going to take a while. Here. Uh, you've you've mentioned, of course, uh, long form journalism, long form writing and uh, literary journalism, uh, how, how do you see uh, proportionately the, uh, the, the amount of space and energy uh, that you'll put into, uh, say, uh, 
hard-edged uh, journalism, you might even call it investigative journalism, versus uh, uh, long-form literary, perhaps more personal, and uh, if you will, softer things? That's a good question. Uh, I don't, I don't envision us doing a lot of investigative reporting. That's the simple answer. Um, and certainly I don't, I, I can see, well, let me, let me back up a little. When I, the kind of writing I'm talking about is nonfiction storytelling, really. And finding a character and, or finding, a, finding a, 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 an event or a series of events or, or a place and a, ser a set of characters, a town, something like that, and, and, and spinning out the tale and with, with a strong descriptive component. Uh, and I'm not, I'm, I'm not that interested really in doing hard-edged, in-your-face, uh, confrontational reporting. Uh, th th I think we'll have a, a opportunities to do that that will be hard to pass up, and when the story comes along, then, then it comes along. But that's not what I'm most interested in. I think you can, you can do justice to, to controversial subjects better by sympathetic reporting about real people in real situations and what they are experiencing. Um, you can do profiles, you can do um, all kinds of writing that is not expose, but you can still expose wrongdoing through that kind of writing if there's something that needs to be exposed. And so if, if we're going to start doing uh, more of this writing, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna probably find ourselves in some uncomfortable conversations. Uh, but so be it. Hi, um, I'm Charlotte Williams, faculty here at the Clinton School of Public Service. I love your cover of the magazine uh, dedicated to issues of race and equity. I'm wondering, was there any particular uh, reaction to that magazine and to the cover, positive or negative, that you could speak to or that surprised you in a good or a bad way? Well, I wasn't here, so I don't really know. Um, I thought that was a great issue. I loved that issue. And uh, that's all I can really say about it. I just thought it was amazing. Just a, just a tremendous number of the magazine, really good. Great, thank you. Um, could you speak to your experience at Swanee a little more? Um, there's that great story about Andrew Lytle. Uh, yes. Yeah, from John Sullivan. Yes. And yes. Um, it's clear from his other writings, too, that it really had an impression on him when he was there. And I'm just wondering, um, I grew up in Nashville, and I um, spent quite a bit of time up in Monteagle in that area. And it really had, it, it, I mean, it also really kind of had an impression on me, and I'm just wondering, just, you know, the school itself and all of the history, but also just well, the place I, in the region, yeah. Uh, Andrew Lytle taught me how to drink bourbon. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I was, I was lucky enough to know him, and uh, Mr. Lytle, as he was universally addressed, even by his children, I think, uh, no, uh, no, actually, is, uh, um, I, I, actually, I also know one of his daughters, Polly, um, I, be, I think her name's Polly, uh, it's been a long time, but she, um, she didn't call him Mr. Lytle. But that, that place is so steeped in history and, and, and a literary tradition that I can't even begin to talk about here how, how much, how important that was to me. At the time, I didn't even realize how important it was. Because as a rebellious 
18 year old, the first thing I did when I arrived was start rebelling against th that tradition. Uh, but even so, it, it soaked in. And, and knowing people like Andrew Lytle and knowing so, so many of the other great teachers there, uh, John and I share a mentor at Swanee, Tom Spaccarelli, a Spanish teacher, who is the furthest thing from a, um, a southern um, writer. Um, he's from Chicago, I think, and um, is, has nothing but impatience with that pathos. But it, even, even with Tom, it, 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 it soaks in. And, and his, his, to, his, he was also the mentor of Jack Hitt. So th this uh, wonderful Spanish teacher who, who would just rather be in Spain than anywhere um, uh, is, is directly responsible for, for my career for, and I think probably for Jack's and, and John's careers as, as writers in one way or another. So the, the influence of that place on, on my life and, and work is just, I just can't even, can't even begin. Jay, we got time for one more question. Roger, welcome to Arkansas. Question is, what kind of influences can we expect from you from a design standpoint, art, photography, cover stories, and just overall design for the magazine? Well, we have a great art director, and uh, he he is going to keep doing his thing. So he and I are going to work closely together and and with the rest of the staff who, who the editorial staff does a lot of that uh, image research and it's a team effort. So my, my voice may be uh, uh, one of the stronger ones in that conversation in terms of deciding this or that, but, but I, I, I trust Tom's judgment and I think we're going to, the, the thing about the magazine is every issue has a different design, by design. The design of the magazine is that it doesn't have a design. What, what you'll see I think from, with, under my influence is a little bit more pattern, reg, a more regular pattern in the formatting, but not in, just in terms of one thing after another, where, where in the book a certain kind of piece will fall as opposed to dictating type faces and uh, things like that. All right, thanks. Thank you all very much. Uh, Jay, good job. Roger. So we need to, we need to welcome Roger to Arkansas by letting him sign a copy of this book that I hope you will buy, it, Modesty of Hope. It uh, talks about uh, power, money, and politics, and what better time of the year to be talking about that. Let's, uh, let's give Jay Roger a really round of applause.